It's a while since I've taken apart a car component, so I thought, well, this one is quite interesting. It's out of a BMW, and it's the ionizer module that keeps the air conditioning system sanitary. And they describe it as an ionizer, but look inside. Let me see if I can just zoom down here and you can see. Look inside, you can see it's got a little ceramic plate in there with a solid conductive surf surface on one side and a series of fine lines in the other. I could probably get you closer to this. This would be tempting fate if I did. I'd end up going way out of focus the rest of the video. So I won't. Um, but suffice to say, it looks like a standard ceramic ozone plate that's been bedded in the little tri drizzle of uh, resin on either side. There is a three-pin connector in the back. I can find out what the pins are for. One of them is uh, the ground, as you'd expect. One of them is 12 volts. And the other is a pulse of modulation input that, depending on the mark space ratio, will determine the output of the unit. But it can also drag that input down I believe, to signal back to the control system that there's a fault in this unit so it can signal back if there's an issue. And it can detect temporary problems, which I guess would be water getting in this, and it can detect more terminal problems that like arcing across that it's just not able to clear. So there's a bit of uh, intelligent stuff in this. Now, I did want to probe around the meter and try and work out the connections. I got as far as thinking that this one here is the negative, but I don't want to risk blowing it up, so I'm going to open it up and we can see what's inside. I've already experimentally taken a screwdriver to one of these plastic rivets and it does snap off. So let's snap off the rest of the rivets and see what's inside. The pulsive modulation aspect's a bit annoying. Hopefully it's going to be something I can override just to actually get this going or emulate it by dabbing a wire on off or maybe uh, just by sticking the wire on continually. That would be full on. I don't know. We'll find out when we open it up. That's assuming I don't let the smoke out. So that's the rivets done. Let's bring the spudger in so I can open this in a controlled manner, having just completely obliterated all those rivets. And we'll see what we can see inside. Is it going to open? Ooh, there's an element of mystery. I'm not sure what this sort of coppery thing at the bottom is. It's almost like it's got screening, which would make sense, given that it is based on a... Oh, you know what? Hopefully, they've not... Uh, resin this in, then slid the whole thing, the circuit board attached the PCB, the little ceramic plates. That would be terminal if, if it was. We shall find out soon enough with scrunching noises of the plastic disintegrating. Ooh. Interesting. That is interesting. What am I seeing? Initially, I'm seeing just far too much sophisticated stuff, quite frankly. I'm seeing what looks like a dedicated microcontroller. I'm seeing the high voltage transformer. The high voltage transformer is coming out to the ozone plate. It's got a sensing chain of resistors here. Uh, it's got a little inductor for suppression, probably a voltage regulator there. Or is that the drive transistor? That might be the drive transistor. Here are the three pins for controlling this. I'm going to zoom down in this and we'll take a closer look and see what we can find. I'm a bit worried about the fact that this circuit board, I can see wires soldered on here. I may have to try and desolder those to get this off. But initially I'm going to try and uh, hotwire this and get it running by reverse engineering, by tracing these connections back and finding what's what. But I'll uh, take a picture of this and we can take a closer look. Some reverse engineering has taken place. I think we're ready to explore this. I'm just going to grab my pointer here. I've guessed, and this is just a guess, this might be the time for the magic smoke to get out, that this is a positive because it's going through what appears to be a fuse and then through a diode, and then there's a um, suppression type diode between the negative and that a sort of transient absorption diode. But then it goes to this little component here, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm not sure if that's just a some regulator or something like that. I'm not sure what's involved in that. The negative does, however, go straight to all the sort of negative points. Say, for instance, these pads here actually make connection with these springy plastic contacts. That This is uh, plated with a conductive screening element, and that does uh, couple onto these pads. It also goes to this barrier here, and the reason for that barrier is that you've got the high voltage in here for the ozone generator plate. And one side of that is reference to the zero volt rail, the, the ground here. And the other side, the high voltage one, this is the spicy one, has monitoring in the form of lots of resistors. Uh, each one 
910k. So it's, you know, it's the best part. It will, uh, it's almost 6 megohm going to that. So it's designed to detect, it will effectively turn that transistor on if the, uh, the voltage across this is high enough. If the plate gets wet and it pulls the voltage down, if it's shunting it, then the voltage there will fall. I'm not sure what it would take to actually uh, turn this transistor off. Um, it's got a couple of capacitors that will limit the uh, current on each half wave from this because this is what appears to be a Royer oscillator. It's got a big inductor. It's got one main transistor that looks as though it's switching power to the Royer oscillator section. And then it's got what appear to be the two Royer transistors. But I'm not sure why some of the circuitry is associated with this bit. I don't know if there's a, a level shifter that's basically trying to control the Royer from that side. I don't really know. I thought maybe I'd just turn this transistor on. Maybe there's a secondary protection that it's got two leap means of control over that. But either way, I think it's time to test it. I have stuck some wires on. I'm going to give it uh, the 12 volts. I've currently limited the supply to 500 milliamps, which doesn't necessarily mean it's even going to protect it. And the pulse width modulation, the thing that's going to hopefully trigger it, just with me getting a bit ferocious with dabbing this onto a connection, uh, I've put a 1K resistor on to limit it. So what I'm expecting here is when I apply power, um, I don't expect anything to happen until I start pulsing this, and maybe if it thinks that I am, you know, producing a valid enough pulse width modulation signal, it may enable the output. I don't know. I doubt it for some reason. Let's turn the power on and see what happens. So... I'll tell you what's happening here. Current is on. Drew a brief spell of 50 milliamps and then went down really low. Am I going to be able to get this to hiss if I dab this on the positive connection? No. It's not happy at that at all. It is not being fooled. No current is happening. That is very, very annoying. That is not... It's not having it. Basically speaking, it says, you're not a real BMW ECM. You're just a bear poking a wire on. Right, okay, that's annoying. Whoa, let's get that out of there. Right, what am I going to do here? What if I provide external stimulus to this uh, transistor down here then? I reckon I can override that because it has a pull-down resistor on the input pin and then it's got a 472 ohm resistor there which is probably going over to part of the control circuitry I think don't really know I can find out or I could just put the supply down there but there, this is the point that I could actually damage it let's try and hotwire this then right one moment please Progress so far. So having failed before to get this to actually activate via the official route, I have tried to hotwire it by taking a connection. I've put a low value resistor in series with the uh, positive feed and I've bypassed this transistor with a flying wire onto the negative rail to try and activate this, but still no joy. Very slight increase in current. That is making me think that the processor itself has possibly some control over those transistors. Now, is it a Royer oscillator? It looks like a Royer self-feedback oscillator, particularly this big inductor. Or is the actual processor running at a specific frequency? It would make sense for it to run at its own natural frequency. So I'm guessing that there's some meddling going on from elsewhere. So the next thing to do is to start taking these connections off. And then take the circuit board out and see what I can see. So I shall do that. Uh, things worthy of note. This metal screen in the front... I don't think it's for electrical separation. I wonder why there's a little sploosh of resin in that there. It's because right on the other side is an electrical connection. And it goes via, well, here it is. It goes via a 100 ohm resistor onto the general mass of ground. So that is presumably just for screening to pre prevent RF noise. They're very sort of, it's quite posh, if you will. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to desolder that and desolder these if I can, hopefully not damaging the ceramic plate in the process. And I'll lift the circuit board out and see what I can find. So I shall be back in a moment. 
Well, this has been slightly frustrating on the basis that this is a multi-layer circuit board. And it means that I was thinking it was a double-layer board and it, things weren't making sense. But now I've discovered it is multi-layer. I can find where things are going. I'm just going to tame this down just a tiny bit. I removed the transformer. It's the only way to measure this. The transformer has such uh, heavy windings in it that it just the meter can't differentiate between uh, one term and the other. So what we've got here is we've got the standard ROR configuration where we've got the center tap coil going to the positive rail and uh, then either side of that coil is pulled to the negative rail by these transistors here which appear to be more or less NPN transistors. There's a feedback winding which then provides signals to the base actually. Where is my notepad? I doodled this down. That would make sense to actually show you this. So the positive goes to the middle of that winding. There is a capacitor across that winding. That's uh, this thing here. And then there's the two transistors with the feedback coil and they go down to the negative rail which then goes via an inductor here which is this big chunky inductor here. It's this fairly standard configuration. It's used in things like uh, the cold cathode power supplies for the, the old uh, the old uh, K tubes you used to get for PC cases that sort of lit up. They were long, thin fluorescent tubes and in video games. But the thing is, normally I would expect there to be a resistor on either side biasing that, that to the positive rail. But in this instance, I can only find one of those resistors. So it's switched to the positive rail via this transistor here. So there's so many things. Uh, it, this must be just safety features to prevent the failure of one component resulting in the ozone generator coming in all the time, which could cause major irritation, particularly if the air was coming into the vehicle. Um, so there's this transistor isolates the whole lot, so I've bypassed that. This transistor isolates the drive to the control circuit, so I've uh, bridged that out. Um, and there's other things that the power of the positive rail doesn't even come down here. I think it's switched as well, so they've got so many ways it's controlled. However, let's put this back together. I have put uh, some new connections on this, so I'm going to put the transformer back in. Let's get some solder and just tin one of those pads. So I'm going to tin one of these pads and I'm going to put this transformer back down. Note the little spacers here. These little in indents are like stuck onto the board. I don't think they go right through. No, they don't. They're just little spacers that I'm guessing maybe to lift this off the circuit board to prevent tracking across underneath it. A lot of thought has gone into it. It is, I suppose, ultimately, given how much uh, BMW costs, that's not really surprising. So let's align these up. I'll zoom down a bit for this. And we shall try and reflow that. And I shall do that one. Is that? Yes, it has. And then I shall turn it round and I shall do a diagonally opposing one, which is the high voltage side. Oh, that's what I mentioned, didn't mention. Bring this back in. So once this is oscillating, it's inducing a high voltage in this winding. There's a capacitor or a multiple capacitors and then the dielectric barrier discharge, which involves a conductor on one side, an insulator and then a conductor on the other. And then uh, as current tries to couple backwards and forwards capacitively, it creates a corona discharge in their purple corona. In this case, it's the piece of ceramic with this pattern on one side and then a solid layer on the other side. And this will get surrounded by that purple corona discharge. If everything goes to plan, maybe it won't. We shall do this. We shall try and hotwire this. Hotwiring BMW components, but in a completely different way. I have to say, I was hoping that this was going to be super simple. And if, I have to be honest, if this had been the Chinese replacement module, they wouldn't have had all this circuitry in it. You'd be lucky if it ever reported a fault back at all. It'd probably just be when the thing provide the PM, PWM signal, they might even just gate the thing directly or they have at the very most a little ubiquitous microcontroller in there just basically interpreting the signals and then just faking it with absolutely no safeties whatsoever because that's what they do. And as a result, the circuit board would be very, very empty. Right. Another thing that could be bad if you had the ozone generator running all the time is you could end up with a 
damage to the actual the air conditioning components. So now I'm going to put this back in here because I have to. I can't power it up out of this thing because open circuit could damage that little transformer. So now, oh, and in here, uh, notice that it's all metalized. It's all screened inside. One leg is the one that's connected to the common negative rail. So it's more or less got a bit of clearage, but the high voltage one uh, has really big clear clearance around it. I'm guessing there may be te technology to detect arcing across in there. I'm not really sure. Are these pins going to line up? I also have to keep in mind there's that tab there. This this might be where I have to pause if these things don't line up properly. It's all a bit of a fit. I wonder uh, how they align them up in the factory. Well, that's the ones that matter lined up. Uh, that one is not lining up. This one, this, the case screen. Or it may be lining up, but I think there's a solder in that hole, so I'm going to have to tap that out. Tap it out. Or just gently melt it and hope it's going to come out. No, it's it's actually just bridged across that, more or less. I shall add some more solder and then I'll use rather vandalous techniques to get the solder out of that. I shall put some solder on it. Like this. It's quite a big hole in there. And then I shall melt it like this. I'll break the wires out the way. I shall put the solder iron on like that to thoroughly melt all that solder. And then bang it. And that is it clear. Excellent. That's what we want. Let's try this again. Oh, look at that. It just dropped in perfectly this time. Perfect. Uh, I'm not going to bother too much about the screen over there. I'm only really interested. I'll tell you what, I will solder it on because uh, if this doesn't work, then I think I may say, well, that was interesting. That was a fun experiment, but it's far too complicated. It's not quite the hot wire and have also an approach I was going to, I was expecting. So let's uh, solder that in anyway. The screened casing. Right. Okay, it's the moment of truth. I'm just going to pull out a little bit here. I'm going to connect up. I've got a limiting resistor here. I've got the negative. I've got my bias, which I'm going to twist apprehensively. Actually, uh, I'm going to dab that onto there and just see what happens. So let's bring in my 12 volt supply. And I'll put that on there. And that on there. The current is not terribly high. What happens if I go like this? Oh, there's definitely current flowing. Hold on. Oh, yeah. That is very ozone. Hold on. The current is going up to 300 milliamps. Right, tell you what, I'm going to pause my moment and I'm going to see if I can see the glow. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I have had to turn the voltage way down. I shall turn the power on. I shall turn this light off and hopefully you'll see that lovely purple corona discharge going on in there. There's quite a lot of corona discharge. This thing at the full 12 volts draws quite a lot of power. It really is power hungry and the transistors, well, one transistor in particular gets pretty hot. Uh, one moment, I'm just going to uh, check that thermally. Okay, I have to say with the current, it's set to eight volts a moment, it's drawing about an amp the bit's getting hot is the electrode, that's the high voltage electrode where it comes through, is getting hot. The transformer string a bit of warmth. But the actual circuitry, the transistors, are running stone cold. In fact, the, the bias resistor over here is actually hotter than they are. I thought that was going to be a different story. I thought those transistors were getting cookie hot. So that's interesting. That one bias resistor is all that's required um, to actually uh, make the Royer oscillator run. So now that I've uh, boosted the voltage up, uh, high voltage, high voltage everywhere. If I uh, take the exposure off and knock this back, in fact, if I focus on this first and just give you another look at this ozone generation, because that is quite vivid. That is putting out a ton of ozone. I suppose, technically speaking, eight volts at an amp. Let's try it. Let's bump the voltage up. Oh, it's actually 
it's regulating the current. Well, that is just getting more and more ferocious. That's it, an amp. Um, that's getting ferocious. 10 volts, it's 1.5 amps. So that's about 15 watts of ozonating power. I'm going to turn that down. Uh, note how as I turn it down, it just gradually peters out and only bits are active. But that's an interesting, very interesting. So watch your eyes. The light is about to come back. Uh, so that is interesting. Very, very interesting. I should turn that off now before I ozonate the place to death. So it turns out you can hotwire this system. I'm going to have to show you in the original drawing what to do here. If you want to just use this as an ozone generator, and this is not something that BMW would probably recommend, you're going to have to bypass the circuitry in here that shuts off the positive rail here. So you're going to have to basically put a plus volts on here uh, or on this side of the inductor. Uh, then you're going to have to bridge this over to there to get it active and that will then be connected to the negative pin or you could just have a hot wire. And then to actually activate the thing here, that positive, you're also going to have to jump a wire from the positive over onto that pad there, which will then provide the bias voltage to the transistors in the oscillator and that will bring it on. But I don't see many people doing this. I really don't see many people doing this at all because it would be a weird thing to do. But uh, having said that, it's just the fun of reverse engineering. So positive to here and also jumpered over to that little bias transistor and then just negative going from here, jumping this out, either jumping this pad to this pad or jumping over onto here and then connecting to the negative rail in general. But there we go. How to hotwire the BMW ozone generator.